I know, 6,000 years ago, it was like, for me, I I felt the same way. I, I was like, what? How can I believe this? It was, but then I started, you know, in that one, that one, you remember that story is one is the one where I I I knew something in this language from six thousand years ago that I never studied before, right? And and something came in my mind from my memory, I guess, you know, that's that word Asha. And I didn't know, I don't know that word. I didn't know there was a word, I, you know. And then, and and it came to me, and I I somehow knew that it was in this ancient language called Sumerian, and so I looked it up on the internet. I looked it up on the internet. This was when did that happen? I can't remember exactly. It was, I, oh yeah, it happened in 2014, so nine years ago. So I looked it up on the internet, and it was a real word, and it and it meant it meant it meant cosmic order it meant like cosmic order in the universe or something you know so that was a that was a real word i didn't know it just came to me and i knew that and it was in this language from 4000 uh, 6000 years ago 4000 bc 6000 years ago right it was pretty normal it was pretty regular you know i was uh at university i learned to meditate when I was at university, and that saved my life in the in the near death experience because I had already been meditating for two years before my near death experience, was where I almost drowned. And you know, it's not it wasn't a regular near death experience like a lot of people or a classic. I sometimes call it a classic near death experience. It was not. A classic near-death experience like a lot of people talk about on youtube and in books and stuff and they you know i didn't i didn't go to the light and i wasn't on the other side uh in heaven or wherever but i i almost drowned and i came out of my body my mind came out of my body and i saw myself and i was i was going down in the water you know i was watching i was I was out in the middle of the ocean. I got pulled out in the ocean by a current called it's called a rip current and it, and they're all around the world in the ocean and they're like rivers in the ocean and they can pull you out really fast. And I got pulled me out almost 2 miles a friend of mine told me I was almost 2 miles out and um and I and I and I was going down cuz in the water I was sinking in the water was, because I was I was holding my breath but I almost drowned. And I left my body for a, no, like that, that fast, very fast. I just left my body, but I decided go back in. I decided to go back in. And the reason is because I was not, or, you know, it, it, I was not surprised. Well, I was surprised, but I was, I was, I was familiar is the word. I was familiar with what that felt like to leave my, to be observing my body. I could see my body. Because I'd been meditating for two years. And, and in my meditation, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes in my meditation, I would feel like that, you know, really expanded, kind of floating in my meditation, a feeling, and outside of my body, not aware of my body, and just aware of my mind. And, and so when that happened, when I almost drowned, I was familiar with it. And so I decided to go right back in. If I had not done that, my body keeps going down in the water and I'm, you know, I'm on the bottom of the ocean. I can't get, uh, I would drown, right? What, what I teach is a technique where the noise in our mind is not a problem. So I teach my students a technique where the, the noisy mind is not a problem at all. Everybody's mind gets noisy sometimes. And it's not a problem in the way I teach the technique. You do not focus on the on anything. You don't have to clear your mind of thoughts. Your mind can be very noisy. It's okay. So, well, that's what happened in my near-death experience. It was just what I just told you. So some people will hear that and they say, well, that's not really a near-death experience. It's an out-of-body experience. Okay, fine. 
I, I don't argue with people about these. You know, it's okay. People have different labels for things. To me, life is about all different kinds of experiences that we have. And what can we learn from these experiences? That's the way I look at all of them. How people label the experience does not matter to me. Uh, sometimes people like to label things because it makes it easier to talk about. I understand that. But um, so, you know, whether, whether that's a near-death experience to some people it doesn't really matter. I almost drowned. That's all I know. And I didn't even know. I didn't even know what a, a near-death experience was. I didn't know the, the term. I didn't know the term near-death experience or NDE. I just learned that term recently maybe i don't know five six years ago i learned that term i've never really studied this stuff to learn to learn all these these terms that people these labels that people use so it's whatever it was an experience that was very powerful almost died and that's all you know that's what happened so that you know there's different people dif you use different definitions and yeah. you're right and, and there's different definitions and so forth and I respect that, and that's okay. But um, it really doesn't matter to me. What matters to me in life always, whether it's near-death experience or whether it's meditation or past life memories, is how can it help me today? How can I? How can it help me in a very practical way today? Is it useful for me to help me live life in 2023 planet Earth? That's what matters, right? The one that's in my mind the most is the one where when I was a slave. Remember that one when I was a slave? It's, it's I talk about it at the beginning of the book, and then I talk about it more later in the book too. I almost died uh, on the Mediterranean Sea when I was a Carthaginian slave. I was I was uh, I was captured from my village. I was. I was African, so I had very, very dark skin, right? And I could see my skin in the experience. I could see how dark, you know, black my skin was. Um, so I knew I was African. And then I later had visions of being captured from my village in uh, Western Africa by these, you know, these these soldiers. And they they captured all the only men. And they only captured the strong men because they made us into slaves and we were rowing on their ships, right? On the Mediterranean Sea, fighting the Carthaginians were fighting the Romans. So I figured that I got all these little pieces, not all at once. I got, I don't know, probably two or three dozen different pieces, 24, 36, 50 different pieces of this lifetime would come at different times and i had to piece them together and see oh that goes with this and um it it took me some years to figure out that that's what it was from and it was about 2300 years ago 2300 years ago approximately and i figured that out because i started to be able to see the ships and so i could see the ships had all these oars you know so all these people, and then I, I had this memory of being chained down. You know, you got chains on your wrists, on your to the oars, and you got your chains around your feet and your legs to the to the you know the ship, and and then um, fighting. I had the memories of battles, and then where we're just rowing very fast, we can't see what's going on uh, up on on top of the ship, right? But we could hear it and they hear the fighting and we could hear the explosions and stuff because they're 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 burning things. They're throwing tar onto the ships and they're burning. And and then eventually my ship got blown up, got explo exploded, and I was on a piece of the ship. Uh that was the first memory I had was seeing myself on this piece of a ship or a piece of something. I didn't know it was a ship at that point until much later a piece of wood in the, I thought it was the ocean because I couldn't see land, but it, later I figured out it was the Mediterranean. Yeah. And I lived and I, but the, the but the, it's the reason I remember that, that memory so much is because I 
realized how strong my mind was to keep my body alive long enough for some fishermen, I think, came and rescued me. But I, it, I realized how strong my mind was. That's why that memory is the one I remember the most almost every day, you know, because it's like I, I willed myself with my mind to keep my body from dying. I think my definition of fulfilled life, I would say, is, um, you know, we all have desires. We, yeah. we want we we want certain things to happen right that's a desire right i just yeah. i want this i want that i want this to happen those are desires i to me i think when our desires are fulfilled more you know we have more fulfilled desires to me that's a fulfilled life and so i the way i teach my students is i i teach them how to think more clearly about things and if we can think more clearly about things then our thoughts and in our actions what we do can be more effective in making our desires happen so that's to me a fulfilled life right the more nobody's perfect nobody's perfect nobody's all their desires are always ha happening no but can we make our lives more effective by our thinking being more clear and our desire and our thinking and our desires becoming more in alignment, aligned, right? So when they're more lined up, then the desire is fulfilled, right? And a powerful mind is two things. Yeah. Clear thinking, like you're saying, very important. And the yet second thing is and maybe even the first thing you could say is powerful mind and clear thinking those two things if the mind is weak even if the thinking is clear that the weak mind will not have powerful thoughts right so thoughts need to be clear but they need to be powerful also and powerful thoughts come from what a more powerful mind that's what I teach when I teach my students to meditate. The meditation makes the mind more powerful because I don't know if you, you um, I don't think I talk about it in this book, but I talk about it in my other two books. I talk about this, the Houston Astrodome analogy. And it's like the Houston Astrodome is a, is a big, huge football stadium. It used to be in the United States, in Texas, in Houston, Texas. And huge. And it was the very first one in the world that you could put a roof on. And, and maybe 90,000 people, 80,000 people could sit in there and watch a football game or baseball or watch a concert or whatever, you know. And they put a roof on it so you could air condition it. And it was the very first one in the whole world. Now there's probably 10,000 of these, you know, in the world, right? Yeah. I'm sure. In Vietnam, I'm sure that you... There are there are stadiums, big stadiums in Vietnam, right? Yeah, and they, and, they, and some of them can have roofs, right? This was the very first one in the world, and so 1965, I think it was built. So long, long time ago, 60 years ago, it was built. Okay, so anyway, one of my students, one of my meditation students, told me a story that his professor at the University of Houston, psychology professor told the students and the and the psychology professor said all of you students incorrectly you're wrong about this but you incorrectly think your mind is like this little 8 inch little 16 centimeter bucket sitting on the ground in the middle of this huge football stadium and that you think that that's your mind you think that's all there is to your mind because is this oh, one little one little desk lamp a little lamp is on this over this bucket this little 16 centimeter 8 inch bucket and the rest of this football stadium is dark it's at nighttime you can't see anything and you're the only one in there the only person in there 80,000 empty seats and you and he said that's not your mind your mind is huge it's the whole football stadium 
But you think the mind is a little 16 centimeter, eight inch bucket. No, 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 no. And so then I've, so I use his story, his analogy. I use his story in my teaching now, or since, you know, then this is a long time. I've been using his story for 50 years now because I tell my students, that's what I teach. That's what my meditation technique does. It, lights up the rest of the football stadium that is your mind that's how you make your mind more powerful you see that's good 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 work that you are doing yeah that's so sad if they've lost a loved one or a family member somebody has died in there who's close to them and the, the the grieving experience i'll say a few things the grieving the sadness that they experience is very normal very normal human emotion to experience sadness when we lose our loved one. Of course, it's very normal. And I think worldwide, I have I have students, you probably know this, I have, I have students in 60 countries, and I help them with all these issues around death and dying and so forth. And um, worldwide, I think we, we as a humanity do not do a very good job helping people who are grieving helping people who are in the state of very, very extreme, powerful sadness. Yeah. And um, it. I think the first thing is to understand that it's normal. I've lost, you know, the story about my mom. I think I, you know, you, you've read about that. You know, my mom died when I was very young. I was 29, 30 years old. My mom died. Uh, she was only 50 years, 50, mid fifties, 50 years old about, you know, and she died very suddenly. And I cried a lot when my mom died. And it's very normal for people to do that. Doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman uh, crying, you know, men feel like, oh, I shouldn't cry. No, it's not a sign of weakness to cry. It's, it's a sign of strength, in my opinion. And it's also a sign of how close you were to that loved one, how close the relationship is, is 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 directly related to how sad we are otherwise why do we feel so sad we feel so sad because we're so close to them we miss them and it's very normal here's the here's the positive thing i could say in addition to allowing our mind and our emotions to experience that don't resist it um there's nothing wrong with you and how long it takes to move forward is very individual and personal to each person right there is no one way that works for everybody there's no there's no time timeline that works for everybody you just have to be patient with yourself and talk to people talk to other people about this it's very help it's very helpful and it, it helps release some of the tension to talk to people uh, of course we've already talked about meditation can help but also understanding that you will see them again. You will see them again on the other side. And I have had many, many communications, as you know, with my dead loved ones of mine and many other people's dead loved ones I've had a communication with on who are in the afterlife, in heaven or the other side or whatever you want to call it. So I know that we will see them again. I've had that experience myself already. Right. And I know many of my students have as well. So, you know, it it doesn't replace them because, look, I've communicated with my mom on the other side. I still miss her. I still miss her. It doesn't matter that I can communicate. I mean, it does matter. It's it's helpful, but it it's not the same. It doesn't replace the fact that we can meet each other on the other side as well. Yeah, because we. we we will recognize each other. That's the thing. We will know. Like I tell my students on the other side, we have sort of what I call an energy signature. It's kind of like a signature, but it's an energy signature that is unique to you. And my energy signature is unique to me. Every, every soul, every being has their own energy signature. And we, we can recognize that. Yeah, the title of the book, my first book, is Overcoming the Fear of Death. That's the main title, Overcoming the Fear of Death. And then the subtitle is, is 
through each of the four main belief systems. So the whole title is Overcoming the Fear of Death Through Each of the Four Main Belief Systems. And this is a non-religious, so it's not a religious approach to thinking about death and dying. Uh, so the beliefs that I talk about are not religious beliefs. The, the beliefs, the four beliefs I talk about, are the beliefs that are underneath all the religious and cultural beliefs that exist about death and dying. And so what's the four beliefs? That's the first one. Science belief. The science belief is no afterlife. The mind is, is the brain. And when the brain and the body die, the mind shuts off. That's it. The mind ends. Okay, that's beliefs number one. Belief system number two is belief in an afterlife, belief that the mind does continue after the biological body dies. But there's fear. There's some fear. So I call it the fear of continued existence. That's the second belief system. All right. And the fear could be for many different things. The third belief system is belief in an afterlife, belief that the mind continues, but no fear. Mighty might person might even be looking forward to going to heaven or the afterlife or whatever. That's the third belief. Fourth belief system is reincarnation. That's that's what this book is about, right? Yeah. Past lives, reincarnation. So that's this is the new book, right? That's what this one is about, is the fourth belief system. The first book is about all four belief systems and how we can think about it. I'll show you a quick picture in case the audience is curious what it looks like. This is the first book, Overcoming the Fear of Death. That's what the first book looks like, yeah. So... Um, I, I help the reader look through those four different belief systems and figure out how they can reduce their fears about death and dying through each one, right? Now, the third one, they probably don't have a, a fear about death and dying. So but in the third one, I talk about NDEs and I talk about communicating with the other side and examples of why somebody who has a third belief system does not have a fear about death and dying so so we talk about that uh in the book so it's a way for people some people buy the book because they want to get rid of their fears about death and dying other people just get the book because they want to know how they can talk to other people who have different beliefs about death than they do main message i would say out of the three books because my, my second book is, is a collection of 67 essays that I've written, right? About, uh, called Marcus Aurelius Updated. And it's it's about all different things. Love, pain and suffering, um, angels. I talk about so many different things, emotional things. Uh, I talk about cruelty. I talk about um, being a good person. And I talk about, you know, bad things like bullying and how, how to deal with it and forgiveness, how to deal with forgiveness when somebody has hurt you. And I talk about angels and God and what's our purpose in life and whole different things in that second book. So if I had to say one thing about all my books that would be useful for people, I would say to learn from what we are doing in life, to learn from our past experience to pay attention and, and, and to learn from the mistakes we make that and understand that nobody is perfect. None of, nobody's perfect. And so don't be too hard on yourself. And if you do remember past lives, even if you don't remember past life, if you do remember past lives, then use them to, pre then to prepare yourself to live today in the present more effectively and with more happiness. But if you don't remember your past lives, it doesn't matter. Remember what you're doing this lifetime. And also you can look at your emotions, your emotional patterns. And what does the emotional patterns teach you about yourself? To me, that's what I teach my students to do, is to look at themselves and learn from their own experiences and about their own personalities, because we each have our own personalities that's unique to each person. What can that personality teach us? Okay, bye-bye.
Take care.